Uh, friends, we are starting now. Today is a 213th Friday group meeting. The speaker is my good friend, SS Ray, Seshadri Shekhar Ray, prominent advocate. The topic, today's topic is the essence of constitutional morality. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, the way you made it, the uh, discussions and as you made it, such a topic, interesting topic. In fact, we are uh, trying to make series of lectures on constitution, 74 years of uh, Supreme Court and Constitution. Shekhar Nafde even part 1 and 2 and very interesting this thing. So before we start, I ask uh, Madhu Yadav will be here. Good afternoon everyone, respected members present here, to Mr. S. S. Ray for gracing us with his presence and sharing his valuable insights today. Mr. S. S. Ray is highly experienced litigation practitioner with over three decades for, of practice primarily before the Supreme Court of India and Delhi High Court. He is graduated from the University of Delhi with Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and later he obtained LLB from the Campus Law Center. He also holds an LLM in Corporate and Finance Law from Jindal Global University. Throughout his career, Mr. Ray has, has worked with prominent legal firms and advocates including Dr. Rajiv Dhawan and Mr. G. Ramaswamy. Before establishing his own practice, his legal expertise spans a wide range of areas including constitutional law, civil law, criminal litigation, corporate law, arbitration, mediation, family law, and environmental law. Mr. Ray has been actively involved in arbitration, conducting numerous domestic and international commercial arbitrations. He has also contributed significantly to infrastructure development projects, drafting concession agreements for bodies like NHAI and state governments, and has played a key role in shaping public-private partnerships. In addition to his legal practice, Mr. Ray has been involved in legislative drafting for various states. He has also taught, he has also given faculty lectures in Amity University. He is also engaged in mediation activities holding qualifications from organizations like Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee and the Singapore International Mediation Institute. Mr. Ray's contribution extends beyond the courtroom as he has frequently speak at national and international workshops on dispute resolution, mediation and infrastructure development. His career reflects a deep commitment to legal education, innovation and dispute resolution and the advancement of legal frameworks in India. Let us express our heartfelt gratitude, gratitude to Mr. S. S. Ray for coming here and enlightening us. Thank you, Madhu. She is our ranking member. Uh, yes, that's good. Thank good. you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madhu. Thank you very much, Mr. Seshagiri Rao, Seshu who I have known here for more than three decades. I think on the very first day when I came to the Supreme Court in 1993, I must have met him. And he's been a consistent and good friend ever since. Thank you very much, Seshu, for inviting me for this. I know this program has been going on for now. This is the ninth year. And uh, sitting here in L2, Seshu very casually mentioned to me that why don't you do one of these programs. I said, okay, fine. I immediately agreed to it. But the bigger challenge was, what was the topic? So I suggested a few topics, which he promptly shot down. Huh? And he asked me to rethink. So I zoomed into this topic, which is the essence of constitutional morality. Now, constitutional morality, the topic today, before I begin on this, it's just a small quotation which I have found at a, while researching by this German philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche, very famous philosopher. He says that if you kill a cockroach, you are a hero. If you kill a butterfly, you are bad. So morality has aesthetic standards, right? But here what we are speaking of is 
कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मोरलिटी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल मोरलिटी डज नॉट फाइंड एनी मैंशन इन एनी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल टेक्स्ट नॉट इन आवर इंडियन कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इट डजन फाइंड एनी मैंशन इट इज वन ऑफ दोज डॉक्ट्रीन्स विच हैव डेवलप्ड एज अ जज लेड डॉक्ट्रीन फॉर एग्जाम्पल मैनिफेस्ट आउट ट्रेडनेस रीजनेबलनेस वेंट्स बेरी रीजनेबलनेस दीज हैव ऑल इवॉल्व दे आर नॉट फाउंड इन द टेक्स्ट because we are a common law jurisdiction giving a lot of uh, you know we rely a lot on precedents so therefore our system of jurisprudence is very very creative we have a lot of things which we evolve beyond the statute beyond the statutory jurisdictions so now coming back to the topic of what means constitutional morality <coughs> till the year about 2015 or 16 by the time i had practiced 23 24 years i had not heard of the term constitutional morality to be very frank till the first time or somewhere around the time of justice deepak mishra scott when judgment after judgment started mentioning what is constitutional morality and that is when i got really interested what is this constitutional morality what is it where do i find it is it anywhere in the constitution i don't find it anywhere in the constitution i find morality in the constitution morality can be found in article 19 19 i think uh, 1 and 2 then 25 and 26 that's all these are the four places where you find the word morality but constitutional morality has developed and how it has developed to go back first who was the first person who actually developed this entire concept there was a british historian called george grote he is actually you know uh, he is credited with this term constitutional morality first he wrote 12 volumes on greek history without visiting greece and that is not something which is uh, you know uh, strange because that happens there are a lot of historians who are you can say armchair historians armchair philosophers armchair sociologists only a social anthropologist really has to go to the field so this historian george grote he wrote 12 volumes on the greek history athens and he used the term for constitutional morality <coughs> it is somewhat related to if i may just put it in a very loose and pedestrian way nationalism for example you are born in a country right you are indian you are proud to be indian otherwise what is it these are all borders a geographical border is an artificial border right where you have decided that this is your country this is your geographical border and you have your allegiance to constitution and to the country and so therefore you will fight for your country right you will defend your country right you will defend the territory so therefore just like nationalism constitutional morality also comes from a philosopher's thought process george grote and what did he say at that time in the history of greece in the context of reforming athens constitution and this doctrine according to grote means and we are going to explain how it means differently to different i mean grote was maybe only the founding father who was credited to have actually got this doctrine first time he would have named it and what did he say he said that in very simple terms this means the coexistence of freedom and self restraint on the citizen to so what do you have here you have the freedom to criticize right the people who are ruling you and you also have a duty to obey the rule of law the constitution the people who are obeying you correct or in other words it means an obedience to authority coupled with the right of censuring persons exercising authority so it goes both ways right the background was that he believed that a constitution was necessary to kindle a passion of attachment of citizenry and generate goodwill to imbibe a sentiment which he called rare and difficult to prevent usurpation of power by despots and oligarchs by force this rare and difficult sentiment is what george grote called as constitution morality according to him there are about four aspects which really define that what constitutes constitutional morality 
all citizens would respect the constitution with a they would obey the authorities acting under the constitution they would also have freedom to criticize the public officials acting under the constitution in discharge of their constitution duties <clears throat> that all authorities and public officials would have to act within the confine of the constitution and that all contender for political power would respect the constitution and would expect the other political powers also to respect the constitution there is one as an aside it can be mentioned that in 1883 actually there was this two gentlemen who were two british jurists albert van dyke you would have heard of him frederick william maitland who propounded that the principle that in an absent of written constitution constitutional morality is the rule of law have you figured what i said in england there is no written constitution so what constitutes the constitution we start back right from 1215 when the magna carta came into existence the magna carta was actually a document which was drafted at the instance of the barons and they made sir and they made king john sign this document right and what did it actually mean it meant that even the monarch is subject to the rule of law right that was the first document thereafter what happened thereafter they had this entire lot of <coughs> statutes conventions judicial decisions treaties everything taken together is collectively what constitutes the british constitution so therefore for the british constitution who do not have a written constitution the common law which is settled law the statutory law the treaties all together form coupled with constitutional morality so i think you are getting the drift of where we are going the constitutional morality will not be found in the text of the constitution but it is the essence it is the soul it is the spirit and that is how our supreme court has also interpreted it in several judgments and we will discuss i will discuss about a dozen judgments where constitutional morality has been actually you know discussed has been referred to has been spoken to <clears throat> but first and foremost is how did it come into india very interestingly and this is a background because our in the founding fathers <coughs> ambedkar had gone for his education sometime in 1912 1913 he went to colombia that time he had taken an interest in reading history also and perhaps he came into you know uh, he became familiar with george grote's writings on the constitution in greek constitution that is where he discovered this concept of constitutional morality and perhaps even he didn't know that where he will use it later on because when this constituent assembly was formed to draft the constitution mr ambedkar dr ambedkar was the was at the foremost in drafting the constituent the constitution the constituent assembly actually sat and i have some facts and figures over here that it sat over a period of 165 days and held 11 sessions between december 1946 and december 1949 over 3 years so you can imagine the mammoth task which was before the constituent assembly where they are drafting a constitution 395 articles 12 schedules it wasn't 12 schedules then but it was a big document and when you are borrowing from australia ireland uh, uh, america you are putting together the best in one of the constituent assembly debates and particularly that is of great importance it was on the 4th of november 1948 <coughs> when dr ambedkar first time mentioned this concept of uh, constitutional morality and in what context did he say it? the context in which he mentioned constitutional morality was 
when there was an excessive amount of detail in part 14 of our constitution. The detailing in part 14 of the constitution with respect to the administration, he used one word that you do not need to change the constitution to pervert the administration. So therefore, he wanted, wanted to stress <coughs> that what otherwise appears to be banalities in the constitution, unnecessary parts of it, because the constitution should actually, according to everybody, globally jurists think that it should be a very lean document, right? A very small, lean <coughs> document containing only the essence of what you are trying to convey. But we have a large constitution and it was our forefathers thought that we need it. Why? Because he also said that in India, we really don't have a democratic, you know, tradition of any meaningful sense. And when he said that, it is not said in a wrong way. We have to understand why he said it and we have to relate it to the time when he said it in 1946-49. So what had happened then was, why did he say this when the Constituent Assembly was sitting? What were they trying to do? They heavily actually relied upon the Government of India Act of 1935. They are accused of doing that, right? Which was actually uh, an earlier product. Huh? It was not something new. But when Dr. Ambedkar says this, he has a reason for saying it. We had something like 351 princely states at that time. Now just go back, just transpose yourself back to 1946-49. Go back 70 years. What was the situation? What we see as a subcontinent today, as a unitary force, was not in existence. We had princely states, small princely states, and all of you know that the accession of these states was a mammoth task. With uh, Sadar Patel going to various states, negotiating with them and asking them to, you know, sign the document of accession. And it was with every state. It was not only with respect to Kashmir. We have heard Kashmir very often because of the recent 370 judgment. But it was with every state. In fact, some of the states even, you know, wanted to go to war. For example, like Hyderabad, right? In fact, in Goa also, you know, the foreign government uh, wanted to uh, resist and that's why it came much later in 62. But let's not digress. So the point is <coughs> that when Dr. Ambedkar mentioned this, that we do not have a natural sentiment towards, uh, you know, a demo democracy and therefore we need to have a very detailed constitution. It was justified at that time and it, it, it is still justified. I'm not, I'm not going into that aspect of it. So therefore, looking at part 14, he said that constitutional morality was the first time when he introduced that concept and that was debated. Now that happened in 1949, the constitution was drafted, things went on. Supreme Court has now, we are in the eighth decade of the Supreme Court. And if you look at the history of how Supreme Court has moved in all these decades, very, very interesting is <clears throat> Let me just give a little brief on how it happened. In the 1950s, for example, the 1950 Supreme Court was concerned. And I don't want to get into what, as Sheshu said, that Mr. Navde has already dealt with a lot of constitutional history. But just to give you a little brief recap. 1950 Supreme Court was mainly concerned with agrarian reforms, right? The entire 1950 decades. I am going to split it into decades. The 1960 decade also was a spillover of the 50 decade with the agrarian reforms. The 1970 decade was a spillover of the Golaknath and the finally the Keshavnanda, and with a very very strong government at the center. Huh? The 70s saw a tumultuous transformation in the Supreme Court with all articles which can be interpreted and looked at together. Unlike the earlier Supreme Court, which saw each of the part three articles, 14, 19, 21, in separate silos. In 1970, after the Menaka Gandhi, we saw that everything can be read together. So you had a 14 and a 19 and a 21 being challenged all together. Right. Then we can begin with the 80s. In the 80s, the last nail in the coffin with Minerva Mills goes 
with the 24th, 25th and the 29th amendment which had came and which was the challenge in Keshavananda. That last nail in the coffin goes in Minerva Hills. The 80s has a very, very interesting journey for Supreme Court because that was the period of what we call the Bhagwati Court, the letter petitions and the public interest litigations. And what was said in the tempo in the 80s court spilled over even into the 90s. Because the 80s court, when the letter petition started and there was a lot of public interest litigations, there was a, a socialist court. We had a very pro-tenant and a pro-labor court in many of the courts. <coughs> lot of public interest litigation, not only like the oleum gas, the Bhopal gas tragedy also happened in 1984. And that spilled on with the pollution control and everything in the 1990s also. And it continued in 2000, we will discuss that later. But the 80s is rem remarkable for this reason that the public interest litigation actually came into existence in its own right, including entertaining let letter petitions. The 1990s saw a different political scenario for the reason that liberalization was introduced in the country, but the fruits of liberalization was not seen anywhere immediately. It was seen only in the following decade in the year 2000, when you started having, you wanted to change the laws, you wanted to, you know, do away with the old laws like Sika, uh, Sikh Industrial Companies Act, and then you wanted to have different, you know, places like the Competition Act, MRTP was to go away, things like that. So 1990 goes on to 2000, and in the year, the decade of 2010, Again, the Supreme Court becomes a very strong Supreme Court with the cancelling of the telecom licenses, Vodafone, and remarkable judgments like this. Somewhere in the middle of the 2010 decade, we start noticing this concept of constitutional morality. But that is not when it had come. Constitutional morality can be found as early as Keshavananda Bharti itself. And I'll take you to at least 12 judgments which I have. <clears throat> in Keshavananda Bharati case, there were two out of 13 judges, Justice A. N. Ray and Justice Jagan Mohan Reddy, who referred to the phrase, like the basic structure doctrine itself is relatable to constitutional morality. That is what this is. So, like you will never find the basic structure doctrine anywhere in the constitutional text. You will not find constitutional morality as I have already said so. Some scholars believe that constitutional morality is the will of the people, limiting the power of amendment under Article 368. <coughs> Sirvai was an opponent to this doctrine and he believed that it stifles the power to legislate. But there were other people who believed in this like a Professor Upendra Bakshi. He was a person who defended this doctrine. That was the first case, the Keshananda Bharati case. So for various other reasons, Keshananda Bharati case still remains as one of the very sacred documents for us in constitutional history. Despite the fact that there were a number of, you know, uh, judgments and it is very difficult actually to find what is the ratio. Huh? But nevertheless, it is the sacred document, even till date. The second case, after Keshan and the Bharati, came in 1981. That was S.P. Gupta, the first judge's case. <coughs> there, Justice Vinkat Ramaya said that violation of a constitutional convention would be a serious breach of constitutional morality. So what is he speaking here? He is saying, that when you look at consultation, that part for appointment of judges, it is only a constitutional convention, right? At that stage in 81, because the law it was still to develop in the there were three other judges' case, in fact, thereafter when it came. At that stage he said that a violation of the convention would actually be a breach of constitutional morality. But constitutional morality by itself was not a full-blown full blown doctrine. Yet, people did not still understand. There was a haze about what should actually constitute it. 
<coughs> what should be left out and what is part of it. Then we come, everything is very quiet for about 20 years till the Islamic Academy. Now you will remember that the Islamic Academy, the PA, uh, Inamdar, these are all followed of the TMA pipe judgments. Now Islamic Academy, Justice Sina says, S.B. Sina, and he said something very interesting was on the view that the measure of affirmative action might be constitutionally valid under Article 15.4 and 16.4. And this is very interesting. Nevertheless, it would violate constitutional morality if it violated the doctrine of equality. So you follow where we are reaching. We are reaching to a place where <coughs> we have a number of doctrines which are competing with each other and we have the constitutional text as well. So 15.4 is there, 16.4 is there. Right? And we are giving effect to that. But if it violates the doctrine of equality as under 14, then it will violate the constitutional morality. That was that was what Justice S.B. Sinha held. Thereafter we have <coughs> the Nas Foundation in 2009, the Delhi High Court judgment, a path-breaking judgment by Justice, at that time, Justice Chief Justice A.P. Shah and uh, Justice Murlida, where the constitutionality of Section 377 IPC was being tested. And the debate turned on public morality versus constitutional morality. So really speaking, the first main judgment which really, you know, uh, so to say dissected what means, what amounts to constitutional morality as against public morality. So public may say, the social morality may say one version of it that look here, this is not right because I think it's not right because I think society doesn't accept it, right? But constitutional morality is slightly different from that. So in this judgment, he laid down the constitutional values and not popular societal values, right? Somewhat was a counter majoritarianism on what would be perceived as socially immoral. So what we have to see here is that so socially immoral it may be, but does the constitution perceive it? Now there is another line of argument which says that the constitution hasn't fallen from the ethers, right? It comes from society. It is meant to be a master document, the fountainhead uh, for all statutory, you know, uh, the law which is laid down in the country. So therefore, it cannot be that the constitutional doctrine has to be something at loggerheads with societal doctrine. That is not what it says. What it essentially means is that popular view need not always be there. The rule of law, which is the constitutional morality, has to be followed and therefore the law laid down in the uh, discussion in Nas Foundation with constitutional morality is, I would say, the germ from where it has actually started with respect to the others. <coughs> when the matter reached Supreme Court in Suresh Kaushal's case, that is 2014, this Nas Foundation was actually set aside by a bench of two honorable judges of this court. A subsequent judgment called Navte Singh so Johar, five judge bench, constitutional bench, again dealt with this aspect, right? Constitutional bench held that 377 to be unconstitutional. Here the court held that it must not be guided by the conception of societal morality or majoritarian or popular perception. Rather, should be guided only by constitutional morality. Societal morality was inherently subjective as per Justice Nariman. <coughs> in fact, Justice Chandra should distinguish public morality and constitutional morality in this judgment, where he held that in public morality, the concept of society is determined by popular perceptions existing in society, while constitutional morality reflects the ideal of justice struggling for existence over other notion of social acceptance. Although this is a judgment which came much later than other judgments which I am going to discuss. But it was necessary to discuss it because this is in the same line of judgments, Nas Foundation, Suresh Kaushal and Naftej Johar. 
deals with the same line of thinking. <coughs> Another very important judgment which dealt with this aspect of constitutional morality was Manoj Narula. You will all remember, this was the judgment that referred to <coughs> the politicians who were contesting our would-be leaders who had criminal background, whether or not they should be permitted to contest. So what were we looking at? We were looking at Article 75 <coughs> and Article 164 of the Constitution in the context of permissibility of persons with criminal background to be appointed as ministers of the government. This is a very important judgment where the concept of constitutional morality was invoked. In this case, Justice Deepak Mishra, speaking for the court, actually referred to Ambedkar's speech in the Constituent Assembly and held, and I'll just quote that, that it basically means to bowing down to the norm of the Constitution. So what does he say here? It means you have to distill what is the norm, what is the essence. It's not just the text. Correct? So the norm of the Constitution <coughs> And not to act in a manner which would become violative of the rule of law or be reflected of an action in an arbitrary manner. Commitment to the constitution is a facet of constitutional morality. <clears throat> so what we are seeing over here is that we are not democratizing what is right and what is wrong. Right? There is a constitution and we are going by the constitutional essence to discover what is the constitutional morality. <clears throat> it is not democratizing for the reason that today we are not going to take a vote to say that 377, an action under 377 or, or what has been held in Joseph Schein is correct or incorrect. We are not going to take a vote on that. Correct? So it is not democratizing. <clears throat> the next judgment which comes in 2017 is Shaira Bano. This is with respect to the triple talaq case where the petitioner did not succeed in putting forth his case against triple talaq on the ground of constitutional morality. Why? Because the court said that this is not part of the essential practice. And when it is not part of essential practice, you cannot be protected. Although in India, a very large part, very large uh, majority of Sunni Muslims actually practice. But just because it has been practiced over a long period of time doesn't mean that it has become the law. Correct? So therefore, constitutional morality did not allow and triple talaq was actually struck down. <clears throat> Another very important judgment of seminal importance which deals with this doctrine of constitutional morality is the government of NCT, Delhi. This was another five-judge bench judgment where it held that constitutional morality and this is a very beautiful sentence by Justice Chandrachar who says that constitutional morality requires filling in the constitutional silences to enhance and complete the spirit of the constitution. This actually distills what it means. <clears throat> it means that there are several things said, for example, in part 3 and part 4. What was the, what was the main challenge in the 25th amendment? constitutional amendment. It gave precedence to directive principles of state policy, right, under part 4, over part 3. That was the main challenge. Correct? Over here when he says, it doesn't matter that the directive principles of state policy are not justiciable. It's only part 3, which is. Correct? Which can be enforced. These are your fundamental rights. But beyond that, every human being has natural rights. Correct? And so therefore, when Justice Chandra Chod, as I understand what he says, is this, where he says that constitutional morality requires filling in the constitutional silences. You see, the constitution is a living document. <coughs> it is an organism, right? What is held in Keshananda was that there is a basic structure. Now, you can't turn it on its head and you mutilate. It will lose any kind of resemblance to what it was. 
so there is a basic structure which has been preserved in that basic structure there is a soul and a spirit which is the constitutional morality because the first time when we started reading what is constitutional morality and how does it come in even perhaps the father of this term who is attributed to george grod may not have actually thought that you know his formulation of this principle will be expanded uh, and given such a beautiful meaning so here what it says in the government of nct delhi it was held that constitutional morality requires filling in constitutional silences to enhance and complete the spirit of the constitution and it refers to three particular descriptions the spirit the soul and the conscience of the constitution so this becomes another test right just like the basic structure test has evolved in kesunan bharti so the case of now here there was uh, i'll mention in the passing there was one uh, criticism by the then attorney general kk venugopal on this huh? which was <coughs> this becomes a test on the validity of government action can also be tested right can also be tested now ordinarily you all know your practicing lawyers you know the courts will not entertain a challenge to a policy because that is in the legislative domain right a government action is ordinarily not tested except for certain conditions of arbitrariness reasonableness etc okay and that too in very defined areas for example in contract or in tenders or some other things but not otherwise correct a policy decision is beyond the pale of being looked into by the courts so he says not just constitutional so what he says is the validity of government action can also be tested not just constitutional amendments now this is really a creative it's an evolution what you look at in basic structure is only to see whether the constitutional amendment right it's not just the power to amend that power to amend is a long story that is all gone after 13 4 has come all golaknath and all that aspect is gone right so constitutional amendment is there under 368 all right but whether we have lost the sense of it the spirit soul and conscience is the extension of that constitutional amendment to bring in constitutional morality that is the purpose of it <clears throat> the next judgment which is very important is joseph shine this referred to section 497 ipc this is also five judge bench judgment which made adultery a criminal offense and held it to be unconstitutional now most of you will know about this but the case was whether or not the offense under 497 should be gender neutral because it was only the man who was to be punished the lady was not to be punished right the court actually looked into this and struck down 497 section 497 ipc the challenge was whether the provision was discriminatory against the man and therefore should be gender neutral justice chandrachod again says over here <coughs> sorry in fact held that this provision must reflect must be reflective of an antiquated social and sexual moray of the 19th century and constitutional morality must guide the law therefore criminal laws must not be determined by majoritarian notions of morality which are set at odds with constitutional morality now i'll just take a break here for the reason we are discussing the judgments but there are a lot of other academicians and scholars who speak of constitutional morality for example i found a very interesting document by justice uh, by professor andre bethe andre bethe is a professor in d school he was a professor i think he is retired now a sociologist professor and he spoke of constitutional morality in a very abstract manner not in the manner in how we lawyers understand constitutional morality in fact the exposition in these judgments gave you more clarity on how it is to be read there is another uh and i can bring that thought to you 
I'll bring it at a later stage. It was by Pratap Bhanu Mehta, an article, which referred to how constitutional morality in the current context. But let's not digress on that. <coughs> a very lesser known judgment actually is very interesting on this aspect. It was called independent thought. This was a judgment of 2017. This read down the second exception to section 375 ITC with respect to having sex with your wife who is 15 years of age is not an offence. That was read down by the Supreme Court to say that it is only permissible where your wife is 18 years and above. So that was also held with respect to and what it says over here is the court held that sexual intercourse between a man and his wife who did not amount to rape provided the wife was of the age of 18 or more and in coming to this conclusion the court said that constitutional morality forbid from giving an interpretation to exception 2 of section 375 that sanctify a traditional custom that is no longer sustainable. So now you see that in all these, uh, we have discussed about 11 judgments and I am just remained with one, that constitutional morality has actually been employed as a tool by the Supreme Court other than the basic structure test to see whether or not a particular provision of law of a statute is within the soul, spirit and conscience of the constitution. That is the sum and substance of it. <clears throat> the last judgment which I have and which I want to discuss because we are going to run short of time now is the Sabrimala judgment. The Indian Young Lawyers Association. This is a 2019 judgment that again referred to constitutional morality. If you recollect, the facts were that the petitioners wanted, had sought that there is a discrimination and women of the age of 10 to 50 years also should be permitted to uh, enter this temple, the Ayapa temple. This court was seized of the question regarding the scope and extent of morality as used in 25 and 26. If you recollect when I started this lecture, I said that constitutional morality is not found in the text, but you will find morality in article 19 and 25 and 26 at four places. So this was the <coughs> crux of the challenge in this case. And it said, especially in respect of one fund once, fundamental right to profess, practice and propagate religion, which is subject to amongst others things morality. <clears throat> the question was whether women between the age of 10 to 50 could be, apart from entering the Hindu temple was held to be unconstitutional. The court held that morality as contained in 25 and 26 must mean constitutional morality. That is how it is to be read. That is the only way it is to be read. And not popular social morality. In fact, here also, there is a very telling line where Justice Chandrachur held that constitutional morality was rooted in four steps contained in the preamble to the constitution. And that is where the essence comes from. When you say justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. That is what it is. The preamble encapsulates what you want to bring out as the essence of what should be the constitutional morality. <clears throat> and he added, Justice Chandrachur added secularism. In one another lecture somewhere, Justice Nariman actually said that 1976 the constitutional amendment to bring in secularism was unnecessary. I would say tautological because when you say justice, liberty, equality and fraternity, fraternity itself includes secularism. So secularism as an added part in the preamble was quite unnecessary but that's, that can be subject of another debate on another day. <coughs> Saying that these principles must cover our constitutional notion of morality and here also Justice Nariman also found 
that constitutional morality is nothing but the values inculcated by the constitution as found in the preamble read with various parts particularly part 3 and part 4 the fundamental rights chapter and the directive principles of state policy <clears throat> thereafter actually there was in a passing i may mention there was a judgment of the Kan kantaru rajivaru if you remember which was a review of the sub, uh, sabrimala oh. where a question was also framed for a larger bench a seven judge bench and the question was how to define constitutional morality so now you see how this concept of constitutional morality which started as a little germ in the constituent assembly came up in keshavananda bharati and thereafter after a dozen judgments in sabri mala it is actually framed as a question for reference to be addressed this matter went on to the nine judges reference where the only question was whether in review and minus the facts can we only examine a pure question of law that was the only question which was dealt with before the nine judges and the nine judges held yes we can if it is only a question of a pure question of law we can dehorse the facts we can decide it. so thank you very much i think uh, that brings us to the end of the uh, essence of constitutional morality starting from the constituent assembly right from growth imported by dr ambedkar due to his uh, you know education in columbia in 1912 and when he had the opportunity of leading the constituent assembly and then there was a complete silence for about what about 30 years plus 35 years till it figured in keshavananda bharti and another 40 years later i mean barring a here and there sp gupta and all which really did not make much of a difference because nobody really relied on that aspect in any of the judgments thereafter till in the middle of the 2000s we came to this and finally this honorable court actually framed a question for reference which was subsequently amended actually the question was uh, read differently to be answered by the nine judge thank you very much for being patient for hearing me out uh, and this is mostly a part of my thinking and part of my research and a little bit of my additions to it thanks very much seshu thank you very much teresa i never expected honestly uh, more than my expectation how many people are fully satisfied and convinced is uh, kindly raise and give a huge claps to thank you we have an anger generation not the tanger generation have a such a potentiality about our constitution and media judgment you are nicely dwelt everything honestly 50 60 70 80s 90s uh, 2000 my after shabarimala wonderful i mean that you may point it from islamic church and what not everything you cover i think most of the men that they can do further advanced research on this aspect thank you very much i request good stress to we'll give what of thanks good stress please <coughs> thank you very much sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity just a minute before you started it in fact i didn't see this so whatever i say i'll say from my heart uh listening a very very difficult subject which required so much of research done by our today's speaker like a speaker who is with three decades and very young looking but when he started i initially thought honestly that probably this table will be full because the subject itself was not giving any charm it's a very difficult but very essential subject but when i looked around it it you have made it's a full house that is what reflects he has made some more through to come through your ears and eyes it's a wonderful job i can understand a, a practicing advocate who has gone uh, on a subject which requires a professor to have spent a lot of days to understand picking up from some words but actually hitting the central line of the what i will try to say the maryada or the ethos of the law where you don't find anything defined or anything anywhere 
but when you are in doubt what to do as a judge or as an advocate where you should emphasize it is the spirit which goes linearly along with the time in this living constitution a very difficult subject but the way you have said it it is also very thought provoking uh, it, in my my words i'll say that all those who had heard you here are now matured to a higher level of thinking i thank on behalf of every one of you thank you we thank you all and thank you very much for uh, being here wonderful lectures thank you very much thank you, thank you, thank you. you. just we know that any questions please please do quickly one or two questions we allow <coughs> yeah please so. from your research on the constitution morality is being increased or decreased shall i sir i think as a doctrine it can only be invoked and we don't know what we what we find is given that we are now in the 75th year as a republic we find that there is a recognition to this doctrine so i will say that there is obviously a movement towards accepting it but in larger constitutional matters may not be on a day to day basis when you are fighting for the ordinary citizen for the baker the butcher and the candlestick maker it may not be but it will definitely be when you are challenging some constitutional provision when you are looking at the basic structure when you are looking at so therefore this is definitely a doctrine which will come in as a legal tool Sir, I have to first of all appreciate you, sir. Can you stand? Can you stand? Sir, you have researched such a cases, and sir, really admire that you have researched in that aspect. Find out the people from England and other continents where they have talk about the morality since 1215. So you have pointed out certain years that constitution. You correctly said is not only a hard thought thing with the. he had put it into the articles you correctly analyze but sir question is i have seen so many things you have referred so many judgments up till now but sir i feel that this is the fight between the judicial legislature judiciary and the legislature where the always legislature used to impose certain thing to the directive principles so morality is coming to the question before the judiciary only to that aspect that once the state come to the power they want to implement those idea through the modification in the constitution so how you uh, you are clubbing that morality in the way the legislature which has been voted by the people of india and they are misusing that authority in the way to bypass the morality so sir will you please highlight that how the judiciary will overcome with, with such a thing that this thing may be curb so thank you very much it's a very topical question and which is something which is bothering a lot of people now that is the reason why we have the three pillars of democracy right the legislature the judiciary uh, and uh, executive. executive and the fourth pillar is the press the unofficial pillar that is also the reason why we have given the discussion that we started was where and when i said that there were about 531 princely states it was obviously not possible to unite this entire subcontinent into one country immediately immediately over a period of time yes people started you know <coughs> identifying themselves as indians but they were earlier you know identifying the royalty and the their loyalty was to that particular royalty the princely state <coughs> that was the reason why in india we developed what is called a quasi federal structure correct now coming to your question how do we deal with this every pillar of democracy is to perform its own role the legislature obviously will legislate depending on uh, who is in power or whatever that is <coughs> but the mandate of the judiciary given the tools at its disposal the challenge will always remain open and it always will retain right from if you remember the first case in the us madri versus madison to set aside 
and to retain the right of review. The right of review is there in the Supreme, Indian Supreme Court. In fact, the Indian Supreme Court, I would say, is one of the most powerful Supreme Courts in the world. Our constitutional document is one of the most exhaustive documents. So really, we should not be worried. There is no fight on the legislative. This is a healthy fight. This is how we had envisaged it. This is how we have our forefathers wanted. In fact, there is a great amount of clarity with which they had debated, discussed and have given us this constitution, which I think today, for every lawyer, this is our sacred text. I think I should have possibly answered, made an Sir, attempt to answer your question. Any, any more question? Any more question? Yeah, please, please. Register, please. Kindly forward register. Yes, sir. The preamble, the directive principles, and part three fundamental rights. Is there any other force within the constitution that is a possible force for constitution for, for this uh, morality, for the constitution morality? Moral. Now, uh, just a corollary here to this question. There is one provision related to efficiency of services that somehow does not appear in uh, constitutional morality or even in the basic structures. Should it be there? Is it not a part of constitutional morality? So thank you very much. The exposition of our Indian Supreme Court have culled out the preamble, the directive principles, part 3, part 4 as the basis for deriving what is the source, the conscience and the spirit of the constitution to actually amount to what is called the constitutional morality. Efficiency of service, sir, I don't know what is the source of that. Is, is that the statutory source you are referring to? Sir, it is one of the articles. I don't really remember which article it is. It is one of the articles <coughs> which refers to uh, maintenance of efficiency. I am sure in the, in, the, in the development of law, huh? somebody may and you may also, I mean, in some constitutional development, maybe that could also, you know, get uh, added to one of the sources as one of the ingredients as to what should constitute the spirit of the constitution. But so far, whatever is there, as I have discussed in these about 75 years of uh, constitutional development in this country, that is still not there. That aspect is still not there. But I am sure that is a very important aspect. Sir, yeah. 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 Sir is it possible that uh, we can define constituents of... Uh, it is possible that we can define the constituents of... Uh, morality constitute uh, but not the essence because essence uh, if we see from the point of view of the greek philosophers plato and aristotle the essence uh, of a form like it's a table so if we remove one leg still it would be a table so ingredient without ingredients also the essence could be there if uh, like some criteria if i may just try to explain this on a spiritual level oh. Oh. Huh? we are in essence consisting of a body and a soul you don't see the soul right sure. huh? okay. but you are a body and you are nobody if you don't have a soul so when you speak of constitutional morality, you are speaking of only something which doesn't have a form because it is not found within the constitutional text. Just like common law has developed what is called reasonableness, you see, Wensbury reasonableness. Every now and then we go and we challenge on administrative law to say, please test it whether it's Wensbury reasonableness. And what is Wensbury reasonableness? One of the very short judgments, beautiful judgment, I think four or five pages on associated uh, provincial pictures, nothing else. And that has still now become the stated law. So when you don't find something, but you are distilling it, then that is the essence. Right? To give a very pedestrian example, you have a white, softy vanilla. You can only taste 
the sweet and the cold and the milk but you can find the essence of the flavor vanilla so therefore this is the essence something which is not at the body i think that's as best as i can attempt to answer okay. your question thank you thank you very much thank you we will take your autograph and next page we will take your message